my name's Tom Bellis. I'm the director of marketing at JMIR Publications. And this is our second webinar um, in coordination with the Society of Digital Psychiatry and JMIR Mental Health. Um, today, we're going to be talking about um, uh, writing with impact um, for research in uh, digital psychiatry. I'll be passing it off to the panelists shortly to introduce themselves and just go through the agenda. Just as a reminder, everyone entering the webinar, um, your mic will be muted. Um, we are recording the webinar, um, but we also have open the um, Q&A section at the bottom of the Zoom webinar. So if you do have any questions um, during the webinar or at the end, feel free to um, use that Q&A section to input your question and our panelists will be more than happy um, to field the questions um, either during the webinar or time permitting. Um, and with that, I will pass it on um, to uh, John Torres. Welcome everyone. My name is John Torres. I'm a psychiatrist and the editor in chief of JMIR Mental Health. So after we introduce the panelists, I'll be giving a little bit of an overview about the priorities of the journal, perhaps what we look for, articles that are a good fit. Then again, we'll have other panelists share information and then we'll go into a little bit of a question and answer really with the goal of helping you write the paper you wanna do and get your voice out there. So this is meant to be practical advice. So I'll quickly hand it over to Dr. Charlotte Lees. Thank you, John. So I'm an associate professor at Uppsala University in Sweden um, in health informatics, but I've written for quite a diverse range of, of journals across the humanities, uh, medicine and, and social science. So I have a fair bit of expertise in, in this domain. My advice really is to sort of start kind of rudimentary. So I've got seven tips I really want to share with you. And um, we can dig into that if you want to start now or we introduce John. Let's go through all the introductions first. Let's do the introductions. I'll pause. Yeah. I'll hand it over to Tayan Carsado. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Tayan. I am working as a scientific editor at JMIR Publications. And uh, I, I am a psychologist, clinical psychologist. I have lots of experience in the field of research. I have published over 100 peer-reviewed manuscripts. And uh, I will be here today uh, talking about um, some advice on how to get uh, a, a faster process on things that you should be careful when you are submitting your manuscript in order to have a, a quick and efficient peer review process. So maybe I'll kick us off and we'll go in the same order just on some tips mm -hmm. and advice. So I think all of us are here because we either want to publish papers about digital mental health, you have published papers, you have new ideas that you want to share with the world. And I think that this is a great home and journal to do that. In early 2023, we published a paper on the priorities of the journal. I just want to quickly review them and talk about some of the things that are really good fit and some of the things that maybe not are not as good a fit. There's many different JMIR journals, there's a whole family, so there is a fit. But I think if we think of digital mental health, one thing that we've all in the field become increasingly aware of is the issue of equity. Certainly we know that more and more people may have a smartphone, more people have access to a computer, even people in rural areas are getting access to internet. But what about the people that don't yet have it? What about the people that don't yet say have the digital literacy skills? What are we doing to reach those people, to offer them training and support? And I think that's a research topic that we don't see as many papers come in perhaps as that we would. And because it's a topic that's under-researched, again, smaller papers are gonna have a large impact. Cross-sectional studies are going to have a very large impact. If we have a cross-sectional study that says, does do people wanna use a mental health app? That may be of less interest because we know the answer is going to be yes. If we say, 
how do people that have been classically excluded or digitally marginalized, what is their views on technology? That's a case where a cross-sectional study could be very impactful and we can learn about what are the unique benefits and strengths and weaknesses of this method. So I think understanding the equity perspective is very important. We also have a section called patient perspectives in the journals where people with lived experience can write about how they have used technology, where benefits they have found equally, what harms they have found, we're open to both. The patient perspective part has no article processing fees. We ask that it not be promotional, promoting one product, looking at concepts or experiences. But I think we really do encourage more submissions there. Our team is happy to help someone learn to write a paper or be part of it. Again, I think part of this webinar is helping in that, but I think that the perspective series can often be written with a researcher or clinician. But I think, again, we need those direct voices of people that are actually using it. And those are important papers, so we don't want to minimize them. The other second one I want to quickly touch on is, is are these studies replicable? Because I think we see a lot of exciting studies. We've had smartphones for well over a decade. We've had digital mental health research for say, at least 20 years since Dr. Eisenbach started even this journal or began to field. But what we've noticed is a lot of papers are very exciting to read. We review them. We get excited at the journal. But then sometimes they don't always have that real world impact. And we, we talk about the equity. But one reason is we really want the papers to be possible for people to replicate. How can someone else take up your method, your app, your procedure, your training and do it somewhere else? So if I'm doing this in Boston, Massachusetts, how can someone do it in the UK? How can they do it in Australia? How can they run it in China? How can they run it in Nigeria? We want to see efforts towards replicability, because if it's not something that other teams can replicate and work with, it may not, again, help advance the field as quickly. We realize that some stuff will be under patents or some stuff is harder to share. But I think we want to see the best efforts possible to make it shareable. The other thing I think that we really have not seen as many papers on is working on privacy concerns. I think now by almost 2024, we've seen a lot of frightening headlines over the years of digital mental health lacking privacy concerns in the real world. We would, it'd be interesting, what are solutions to that? What are productive ways to make technology safer from both a technical point of view, from a society point of view? How do we help people understand the risks and benefits? We're not here to say every technology has to be perfect. We realize even online banking, there's possible for bad things to happen. But I think focusing on privacy is important too. The, the last thing I'll mention is, I think anyone who's done research in this space, who has tried to roll an app has known engagement is a really hard challenge. There was a different team this year that labeled engagement is the Achilles heel of digital mental health. And I think that we'd be interested in papers that explore why engagement is hard and look at solutions. Just because things aren't working well, we still want to understand them. We want to research them. We want to share them. We are very open to negative studies. If anything, I think those will have a higher priority and more value. Because if digital health was perfect, we would see health systems using smartphone apps. We'd see virtual reality working now. Everyone would have a wearable. So there is clearly a need for research. And I think studying why these patterns of engagement may be low and what we can do about them would perhaps be very useful and I think help us kind of build the evidence base to move forward. So we're open to a lot of different types of papers. I think some of the issues, I'll just say again, equity, we're looking for more papers on equity and digital literacy, papers that really should be replicable in the methods that you do, whether it's simple qualitative, whether quantitative methods, anything that again, helps us understand engagement is good. And I'll say one last thing, then I'll hand it over to Charlotte around. I think when one makes claims of efficacy, one has to be careful about saying, does it work? And I think efficacy has, it, it's certainly a loaded word, and we do certainly do publish papers on efficacy, but I think that we're happier to publish papers that say, is this feasibility? Is there steps towards efficacy? So coming out as the first paper of a brand new thing and saying it's efficacious sometimes can be a little bit of a setback. So those are more just on some of the high level journal priorities, but I wanna hand it over to Charlotte to really talk about 
how you can turn some of the ideas into things. Because if you look at Charlotte has a background, not only in scientific publishing with hundreds of papers, but also with journalism and popular press. So I think mm -hmm. she's someone that can quickly turn ideas into words on a page, which is not easy. So I'm going to hand it over to you, Charlotte, for some practical tips. Thanks, John. Yeah, so I want to really start with some rudimentary points as well. Uh, I want to make seven points. Um, we can pick up some of these later as well, if, if necessary. The first thing I want to say is before you write a journal article, you have to know the hinterland. So you need to know the literature sufficiently well. And that means whatever the subfield of research is that you want to publish in within uh, mental health, digital mental health or whatever, um, it means keeping up to date. And it, within any article, uh, you need to signal that you're, you're on top of, of the, the literature and what's been published. The second point is against that literature that you've read, decide what kind of contribution you're making. Um, is it a piece of original empirical research? Is it a viewpoint article? If it's a viewpoint article, you really do need to, to have a very secure synoptic vision of, of the entire body of literature that you want to comment on. Those are something that the shortest articles are the hardest ones to write. Um, the third point then is selecting the journal. Um, and it, in which case, you know, decide which journal or better still, which journals are a good fit for your article type. Um, if you don't have a high enough response rate, that might affect the particular contribution or indeed the journal that you want to send the article to. So that, that means familiarizing yourself with the, with the uh, journals that you want to target. The fourth thing I would do is, and it's the first thing I do when I start to write an article, is I start with a title, um, which is very clarifying. Because um, in a nutshell, that's a bit like your sort of elevator pitch. What is it that you're going to, to be uh, talking about? And the most succinct way to do that is to get the title right. Art, uh, journals can be very prescriptive about how you write a, a title of a, an article as well. So you'll need to check on that as well. Fifth is the formula behind writing the article. And I think for all article types, and this is something that comes with practice as well, academic articles can be incredibly formulaic. Um, there's a certain syntax to how you write an article and the journal will be prescriptive if it's an empirical article, how you lay it out. It's highly, um, uh, it should be highly replicable in the sense that John has, has spoken about, you want your research to be tested by others or, or indeed be re replicable. Um, so there's a formula to how you write articles. There's a formula to how you write more theoretical articles too. Uh, and that comes again with familiarizing yourself with how these articles are written. Sixth point I want to make is perhaps the most underappreciated point in um, academic writing, and that's writing clearly. Um, in a way that is plain, plain, clear writing that is accessible, um, that is respectful of the reader. And the better that you, the better and more cogent uh, your writing is, and more less jargonistic, um, the more likely you you are to, to have a broader swathe of readers across different disciplines, even reading the article uh, and enjoying it and seeing very clearly uh, and humbly as well, what your contribution may be. So there's also, I, I saw Stephen Pinker, psychologist Stephen Pinker only, I think it was yesterday tweeted, there was an article to, to show that um, well-written articles do better in peer review. So people like, enjoy good, well-written uh, papers. Um, and I think a tip on top of that is, the more that you read, the more good writing you read, and that's not necessarily academic writing, which has a bad reputation in this score, but um, whether it's good online journalism or good uh, magazine journalism or nonfiction fiction, the more you read, the better you are at gauging what is, is good writing. The seventh point is a point that John touched on, and that's um, stakeholder perspectives. So when you're thinking about your, your authorship, um, 
your contributors on an article, if they're multiple co contributors, and there very often are for original um, medical articles, stakeholder perspectives, a diversity, a genuine diversity of viewpoints can only be helpful. Um, and that's not just in terms of, sort of whether it's a health psychologist and a, somebody who's focused on if it's security or privacy ethics, um, but clinician perspectives and patient perspectives as well. So um, I'll pause there. So viewpoint diversity, incredibly important and hand, it, uh, hand the baton on. Thank you, Charlotte. We'll hand it over to Tayan, who I think you see a lot as a managing editor of things that go really well and maybe things that don't go as well you could share with us. Yeah. So thanks, Charlotte and John. Very inspiring words. And um, yeah, the first thing I would say is uh, the, my first advice would be to the authors to revise the scope of the journal that they are submitting to. Because the first thing we look at when we decide if this paper is going to go to peer review or not is if the, the paper is in scope for the journal. And uh, authors can also write it in the cover letter, like why they think the, the paper is a good fit for that specific journal. Um, that would be my first thing. Second thing I would say that, that it is very aligned what we were both describing. Uh, so John was saying about the importance of replicability and Charlotte was saying about the formulas that we can use to write papers. So one thing that I think it is really important is to follow reporting guidelines. So we have specific ones depending on the type of the paper. Here uh, at JMIR, we have our policy is that for instance, for uh, systematic reviews, we always, it is a, a required to follow PRISMA guidelines. And for uh, randomized controlled trials, RCTs, uh, consort is also required. And there are several others um, reporting guidelines that are not required for us, but are strongly recommended uh, like strobe for observational studies. So I would uh, tell authors to look at these reporting guidelines. They are very useful for when you are writing the paper. They uh, mention specifically which sections are essential for each, which information is essential for each portion of the manuscript for the introduction methods, results, and discussion. And uh, Another thing that it is really important for um, for papers that for that are investigating human subjects is ethical considerations. We always look for that at first. So it is really important to um, mention if the the paper received an ethical approve, approval or if it is this specific. Uh, study is exempt from ethical approval. This should be clearly stated. And I think that's that those are my main things considering what we have discussed so far. Those are, are very helpful. And I agree those reporting guidelines can almost help you structure how to write mm -hmm. the paper. One question for both of you, then maybe I'll give my take as the third one in it is, Let's say someone submits a paper, you get feedback from the reviewers and you go, this is impossible to respond to, or you feel that the reviewers are just really off base. They haven't understood the brilliance of your work. What do you do? Maybe we'll go in the same order. I think everybody has that feeling when they read the peer review reports at first, like the heart sinky thing. And then when you pause for a while and you reread it. So it's a good idea, I think, to... I often print out the, the peer review reports and read them briefly, set, set them aside. It might be even just a day or whatever, but I, I set them aside then return to them. And the more you go through the reports, you very often do see, actually, these are good points. So I think it's important to view feedback in a constructive manner too, uh, and to be charitable towards the peer reviewer who's taken time to, to read what you've written and comment on it. Um, if you then still feel strongly that the peer reviewer might may have missed the point or 
they don't want I mean it could be an issue of clarity with your own writing and I think that's sometimes something I've thought well I could have constructed something better but even then I think you can respect you can write that respectfully within your own response um on very occasionally that's what you might have to do um so that that's how I would tackle that that makes sense what do you think Tyann yeah, I agree with Charlotte from an author's perspective. If I now an author receive a feedback that it is very strongly like try to uh, respond point by point, mentioning the paper where the changes were made. And from an uh, editor perspective, I would say that um, what I always do is to check, do my own judgment about the paper and then check if my judgment is similar to the peer reviewer's judgment. And my ne the next question that I have in mind is that, is this fixable or not in the paper? Because sometimes it is related to the methodology that it is biased. So there is not much that can be done. And uh, in this case, uh, we have to, uh, we have here a, a peer review cascade, right? So we have uh, journals in our portfolio that uh, can publish papers that are not strongly designed, but sometimes the this type of papers they are not strong enough to be published in uh, in journals with a higher uh, impact. So, yeah or they have to be rejected sometimes, like if it is not fixable at all. Yeah, no, I think sometimes it's hard to respond to comments, but I, I think what we are both saying is it's worth giving it a shot at yeah. least or, or trying to do it in a respectful tone or at least explaining the case. Because I do wonder if sometimes people see comments and it can be daunting, especially when there's a lot of points to address, but I think it may just be chipping away at it as possible. One question may well go in opposite order is clearly programs like chat GPT and its competitors exist. They claim that they can write paragraphs and sentences, maybe papers. What do what do we do? I guess, Tayan, you can help us understand the official policy, at least as JMIR around AI. And then maybe Charlotte, you can help us think, what is its role in helping or, or does it have no role at all? And should we banish it? Yeah, one thing that I think it is common sense right now in all publishers is that uh, ChatGPT and uh, large language models, they cannot be an author. This is very clear. Like, And our uh, policy here is that we allow authors to use uh, large language models, chat, including ChatGPT. And we we request authors to uh, declare if they use it and how this was used. Uh, for which portion of the paper, it, was it to improve language? Was it to um, um, refine the research question? Like for whatever they use, ChatGPT, they have to tell why they use it. And we also required sometimes for them to, we encourage them to upload the prompts they used so we can evaluate it. And, and this is also for peer reviewers so because um, not only authors are using it, peer reviewers uh, may be using it too. So we encourage uh, peer reviewers to declare if they are using it and uh, how they are using it as well. So my perspective would be, um, I mean, I think I, I've tinkered with it myself, but one of the things with it, so given the, the particulars of JMIR as well and what one should declare how one has used these tools and the prompts and so on, um, I, I suppose, again, I would say that used to replace good writing 
they're not going to function well if you don't know what good riding looks like. So again, it's a sort of a case of putting the cart before the horse. You want to, to develop your own skills as a, an author. Um, and there will be times, and I've noticed when I've you know played around with it or put things into it, that sometimes it, it, it lacks clarity. Um, some of the phrasing can be great uh, and simplifies things. Other times, it's just not quite there. So it's about developing your own muscle in a sense as a writer to be able to see when does it do things well and when, in fact, does, uh, does it raise another ambiguity in the writing that, that needs to be you know, perfectly pinned down, clarified better. Um, the other thing to be mindful of, which sort of these tools are getting better at, but they still hallucinate, they still make things up, is citations. Um, but that's also a problem in general for academic writing as well. Citation plagiarism, not checking out what one has uh, properly cited. That's a, that's an issue, not just with GPT. We we have to get on top of that too in terms of um, old school writing. Um, yeah, but I think it can be a worthwhile tool. It's not going to go away. So, but again, developing your own skills as a writer, I think, is imperative. I think that's very practical advice. And given that we know that, say, even chat GPT-4, you can look when it was last the data was trained on, it won't have right most of the recent papers. And as we all know, especially in digital mental health, this is a field that moves fast. So, yeah. so one thing is we do look for that your citations are recent and up to date because there's been new things in digital mental health. 2023 is a very busy year. And there's no reason not to be citing 2023 papers. And again, it doesn't always have to be from one journal. It could be from any journal. But I think even if you've mastered ChatGPT, it just doesn't have the most recent information, as we talked about. And Charlotte kind of said, you want to know what is what's happening in your space and in your field. What I want to do now is I think we have a couple audience questions in, in the last 15 minutes and open them up and kind of just hear everyone's quick perspective on them. I'll start with saying, if we want to do studies on underserved populations and how we can reach them and sustain support in digital mental health, are there ways we can do, how would we interact with some of the journals, grant to Charlie or editorial board? How, is, how does one reach out about potential studies and what is the best way to interact, say, before you've done the research? I'm not sure I understood the question properly. Can you read? Let's say if, if you're you're planning a new study, or maybe you've done the study yeah. with up and you have questions, is it a good fit? What is the journal looking for? Yeah. What is the best and appropriate way to reach out and to perhaps phrase your question to the journal? Um, I, I think you probably have a better place to answer this, John. I'm not, yeah. I mean, in terms of how much correspondence you want from potential. Yeah, I mean, my take would be, I think it's okay to reach out with a brief pre-submission inquiry about the theme and idea. I think clearly the journal or editorial board members or, or managing editors aren't going to be able to design the study with you clearly. So I, I think they may tell you this is what the journal is looking for. These are the priorities. I, I think a brief communication will at least get you the general direction. I know, Tyane, you must see many of these too. What's your thought on kind of reaching out letters of intent, et cetera. I think it is worth it to ask because we can like with a like a brief statement on sometimes it's just asking if the paper is a good fit for the journal and we can respond to that quickly with a brief summary. Uh it happens like not quite often but happens sometimes and it is okay to do that. Okay. Perhaps I'd add to that um one of the best ways to see if your potential article is a good fit, regardless of the formatting or who you're including, is to look for other articles, similar articles as exemplars within the journal or other journals. And I think that's always a very good place to start, because if a, if a journal hasn't published remotely anything like, unless you're doing completely groundbreaking work, it's unlike, it, it may signal that it's not a good fit. A related question someone has in the chat, they say, I understand the importance that research should be replicable, other teams should be able to use the methods, but sometimes a lot of digital interventions are 
proprietary, so it's hard to share it publicly. There's valid and good businesses around it. And we also know that many, say, psychology studies have been difficult to replicate historically. What can we do in these situations where you're published, you have some really great findings, but it just it's going to be hard to directly replicate with these solutions on that? And I'll maybe go first just because I see this a lot. I think if it's not possible, say, to use a proprietary technology, it probably means that you can still offer, say, a screen capture video of it so people can really see it and understand it. I, I think that's something we don't see used a lot. You can definitely use video. I think you can have a lot more images. I think you can try to share the common themes around it. Let's say a lot of apps are doing mood tracking. It may not be as proprietary as I think saying you cannot see our mood tracker is a little bit difficult in 2024. So I think maybe you can give examples of it though, or cases or videos or some ways to make it at least that people understand what it is and how it works. Or I think showing that you, you, you there are some barriers to sharing everything we understand it, but that you've really made a good faith effort to make it as replicable as possible because it really is becoming a priority because so many of these digital studies, right, just do not replicate or what gets even worse is the technology, the company for various reasons has to go away and disappear. And there's not even an image of the app anymore. So people reading the paper in two years ago, we don't even know what the thing was. So I think efforts towards it, any efforts towards it, maybe video is what I'm suggesting are good, but what do you think Charlotte and Cayenne? Yeah, I think ultimately sort of understanding academic publishing means when you're in this domain, it should be, science needs to be replicable. So the, the, the best efforts you can make to be, to be clear about your methods and about what it is that you've done, the, the, the more worthy it is, the more important the contribution is going to be. I suppose the point historically with psychology and social sciences where there, where, you know, there has been this failure of replication. Um, to comment on that, I think that's because publications uh, and have become better. Actually, articles are becoming better written, uh, uh, and it's because there's more transparency and greater clarity, and uh, so we can get on top of whether this research is worth pursuing. Science is incremental for the most part, and it's self-correcting. So we need to, uh, and industry can benefit from that. If it wants the citations, we got to make sure things are, are are tight as well in the publication as well. And the best way to do that is to share as far as possible. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I fully agree. Um, I think the only way to make uh, replicability possible is to provide as many details as you can about your methodology and your procedures. Yeah, I'll say we don't have a formal word limit on papers. Usually 3,000 is the informal max. There's many reasons to go above it, but there's appendices, right? We're an online journal. There, there's not paper. You can have as many appendices as you want, and they can be as long as you want. So th there's no need to limit yourself to that. A different question comes in. It says, following Charlotte's point on the formulaic nature of papers and Tyann's point re on reporting guidelines, is there a way to see JMIR expectations for each type of paper, or is it best to read many published articles and extrapolate? For context, I'm working on qualitative studies with thematic analysis. So a little bit for each of you to tackle. Um, yeah, I think that that's a great approach. Just the more you read um, of the kind of article that you envisage you want to publish, you hope to publish, um, get a feel for how previous uh authors have written uh, in the particular style and, and to, to be perfectly honest that's how I have learned to publish you, you, the best way to do it the best way to prepare to write is to see what's gone before um, and often you can improve on that too um, it, it's about saying well sometimes it's maybe the methods weren't as clear as they could have been it could be in qualitative research as well um where there wasn't a reflexivity statement that you could in fact put in a, in an appendix um so yeah i think that this is a good approach yeah yeah i agree 
and just uh, to talk a little bit about, um, I, I agree with Ch with what Charlotte said, and uh, in terms of uh, reporting guidelines for qualitative studies, we also have reporting guidelines available for qualitative studies. That's CORREC, C O R E Q. So you can also look at this reporting guideline and uh, to help you on structuring the writing of the manuscript. This is a question I think everyone can relate to is, it makes sense to read more. There's so many wonderful articles to read. It's all exciting. How do you keep track of the papers that matter most to you and your research overall? So this may be a very personal question. But I wonder what each of you do to kind of, there's just, there's a lot to read and there's only so many hours in a day. So I have a not very eco-friendly response to this question. Um, I find it easier to read papers in hard copy. So I tend to have, I tend to do a very old fashioned filing kind of system with papers, which isn't ideal, um, but it works for me because when I go back to a paper, I have made many comments. I think you've got to find the system that works for you. But for me, hard copy is always the thing. I just can engage better with the paper and, and sort of get under the skin of it um, a little better. But it's not the most ideal system. Um, but yeah, that, that's kind of how I go about the papers that I really um think are important that's i i will print them and engage i do read other papers online and i'll, I'll save them as well and sort of use filing system of sorts there but it's uh, yeah well maybe say less about my <laughs> digital filing <laughs> yeah i i was used to do this way as well as you charlotte i i agree that we engage differently when we are uh, handling hard copies nowadays i organize my folders um in my computer and uh there are many different uh softwares that you can use to organize your own library according to like the topic that you are studying um like mendeley for instance is just one example and yeah, but I, I agree that it's very personalized. Everyone should like find their own way to what works best for everyone. Yeah. I'll say, I use a program called Notion to organize papers. It lets you put your own tags in filing system. I think there's many like it. I have no endorsement for it, but, but I think it's a very useful program in, in that sense to use. But again, different systems to go through it. One question says, how does the journal evaluate digital measurement monitoring solutions versus digital, say, therapeutic interventions? We know technology can help us understand people's lived experience. It can also deliver different psychosocial and behavioral interventions. And I'll, I'll say, I just think the journal's interested in both. It's important to better understand and qualify and quantify people's experience of illness. It's equally important to use that information to help people get better I think we are a clinically focused journal. So I think if a solution is purely technical or purely an algorithm that's done on simulated data, it may be less directly applicable for JMR mental health. I think we do like to see that people have used it per se, but I think both are certainly a priority. I'll aim this next question perhaps to Tan. It says, I once sent a video to a journal and was told it was not professional to use it for publication. What are your thoughts about video in this age of video? We'll say of TikTok and Instagram and different things. Yeah, I I think it it depends on the content of the video, and uh, we have already published videos as supplementary files, like appendices. Um, but it really it was part of like it was part of the methodology so the video was like to was really important to make the study replicable so this was published and i yeah my opinion that is really depends on the content of the video and how the video is really connected and important for that paper but i think if you said in the method said here's our app Appendix A is a video that shows you a two or three app. These features were available to participants. That, that that would seem to fit. Yeah. And I think it doesn't 
I think of the beauty of screen capture and digital technology, you can make it look pretty clean and professional in this day and age. I think this is an interesting question, whereas we only have about three or four minutes, but it says, what kind of ethical scrutiny do we need to apply when we record app usage data that we upload, even by having subject matters, even by having subjects and cells informed consent, but maybe just broadly, what, what are the ethical safeguards and protections we're looking for? And I think perhaps, Tan, you can help us understand some of those. And Charlotte, as a card-carrying ethicist, you can also help us understand why it's so important. Yeah, so we always request an ethical statement in this case. So uh, if the authors did not uh, submit the project for an ethical review uh, board, then they should state why this is exempt from ethical approval. And I have to say that regulations, they are different from uh, country to country. So uh, authors have al al always to declare clearly what's the regulation in place uh, where the study was conducted. And this is one thing, like one thing is about like how ethically the study was conducted. And another thing is about the um, privacy of the data. So one thing is consent form that uh, informed consent that th this um, person mentioned here, this is also important and how this data was handled as well. If the data was anonymized, this is also important to state and to do that as a, as a good practice in research. Yeah, and I'll just add to that. I mean, aside from being very clear in your article about the IRB or the Ethics Committee um, uh, okaying the research to go ahead in the first place, um, I mean, it's about respect for the autonomy, the privacy, the confidentiality of the, of the patients information when they that they have given fully informed consent to participate so they understand why they've participated in this research um, and they've given their time and potentially sensitive health data so it's it's really imperative to get that right and to to demonstrate that to other potential readers and authors and uh, especially if they want to embark on a replication which is the all important thing here making sure that uh, these studies are fully replicable and, and that we've got something tangible as a result. So the ethics is, is, is a keystone to that. Yeah, those are very appropriate answers. And there's one last question I'll quickly answer and, and then wrap us up. Someone was just asking about secondary analysis. Say you've collected a wonderful digital mental health data set. It's a new field. You have a new hypothesis you want to test. Is the journal open to secondary analysis? I would say, of course. I think the only caveat is you should be upfront that's a secondary analysis. I think reviewers and certainly I think our journal staff also gets a little bit confused when we think it's original research and then only somewhere else you have to read all the fine print to find it out. So I think as long as you're transparent about why it's a great new hypothesis, it should be done. That's terrific. And some of the best papers have been secondary analysis from it. So. I would definitely go for it, but I think you're seeing the theme is try to be clear and transparent, whether from it's your ethics to your writing. So I, I wanna thank Charlotte and Tan for joining us. It's wonderful to get a perspective of someone who is so prolific across different mediums. I think Charlotte, you even have published books, right? So you've done books, you've done journal articles in popular press. Am I correct in that? Getting there with the books. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So. Yeah. You've done it in Thailand. You, you see so many papers from, from different J, from JMIR journals and publications. So it's wonderful to have your insights on what can go quickly and what could work. So we'll wrap it up here. We're excited in 2024 to continue this webinar series between the Society of Digital Psychiatry and JMIR. We're updating the Society of Digital Psychiatry website that'll have a new membership page. It'll be free next year to join as well. There'll be more benefits included as well. So we're grateful for this partnership of JMIR, grateful for our two panelists, and thank you for tuning in. Till next time, bye.